Uh, good morning, all. Uh, thanks for having me, and uh, thanks for listening to some of the matters I'm going to be talking about. Uh, again, my, my, my name is Mike Dvorkin. I uh, was co-founder of NCM and I uh, was a chief scientist there. Um, so a little bit of background. Uh, my obsession in life is policies and how to describe various things in sort of declarative ways and how to simplify the management and interactions with the uh, subsystems and systems in general, how to think about data center as a system rather than collections of boxes. Which brings us to an interesting point where, you know, we'll talk about software-defined things and we're talking about software-defined data centers, software-defined networking, software-defined storage, but one thing that we always fail to mention is the importance of metadata and how metadata can help drive the automation within the data center. Right? How many of you like being micromanaged? Because we all know it's a very successful uh, managerial practice, right? When you hear the gentle voice review manager over your shoulder and he tells you what to do, uh, how to write code or how, how to meet your objectives, like that manager always knows how things should be done in which order and they always know about architecture and you know, implementation and everything. God bless those people, uh, they're amazing, but you know, these kind of things don't scale um, both organizationally and time-wise. Uh, unfortunately, if you look at the data center as it is treated today, everything in the data center is micromanaged. Things are controlled in a gory amount of detail. Everything is done through a series of very specific things. Uh, and there is really generally no understanding of end goals. Everything is getting decomposed into very specific elemental things. And if you look at automation, right, and people have talked about a, lo a lot about automation in uh, less than few years. And you can think about it as basically taking the legacy of the human middleware and all this micromanagement stuff and basically trying to industrialize it, right? We're basically trying to take all the procedures that we had before and basically sequence them by a robot, a machine that basically goes and executes those steps without much thinking and without much understanding of what the intent is and without any understanding of what happens when something fails. And people say, oh, it's okay because, you know, it's all going to be, uh, you know, like either undone or reconfigured or there can be a manual intervention. But it costs money and costs a lot of time. So if you look at all these orchestration systems, uh, they're very linear and you have underneath, you have VMs everywhere, right? They're all over the place. And you know, the sort of unit of control within the data center is generally that VM, right? You basically instantiate these v VMs. You, if you want to expand something, you instantiate more VMs. You configure boxes as a side effect of VMs coming into scope. You configure storage, you allocate things. And all of this stuff is done in a linearly, linearly orchestrated ways, right? Where you really concentrate on how to do things rather than thinking about what is it you're trying to achieve. Right. And nowhere in this world do you think about the original intent of what's being done. No one is thinking about how the application is actually affected by any of these things. Right. If you look at how uh, application architects think about applications, you know, there is a very clear understanding of how various things interact and how various things uh, consume infrastructure, how they consume storage, network, how they consume compute. But by the time application gets to the infrastructure people. All of this stuff is digested into a set of very elemental things, right? So there is, you know, side effects of the linear operational convergence, which basically implies fragility, uh, very little in terms of fault tolerance, and self-healing is, is a fantasy. So, you know, a lot of smart people sort of thought about the problem and said, well, you know, we can always rely on the artificial intelligence. Because artificial intelligence will basically always identify what is wrong, uh, it will tell us how to fix things. Uh, it will, you know, basically solve everything. But the most fundamental thing about artificial intelligence is it's trying to reverse engineer the original intent. So what is the application? Like, what, uh, how is the application behaving? All of the stuff that application architect already knew ahead of time, but, has, but, but he has no way of communicating it to uh, the infrastructure people, right? So that's why we have to reverse engineer of that. And, you know, there's an argument like, well, that's how Google does things. But, you know, Google is a very special company and whatever Google does does not always imply, apply to uh, the rest of the world. Right. So, reverse engineering is a very important thing here. 
and let's let's kind of sort of keep it in mind. So if you look at the data center, right? Very in data center, everything is very elemental, right? Even Darth Vader does elemental things, where you know he takes a lawnmower and you know does very humanly things. And if you look at how people deal with infrastructure in general, you know boxes are always a unit of control. Uh, you write scripts, you orchestrate those scripts, you sequence them, and whenever something happens, you execute those linear sequences. But still, you're dealing with things that are of instance at a time uh, nature. And once you get into virtualization, virtualization sort of said, like you know, like because it all it, it's all going to be normalized, uh, things will get significantly better. But you know, operationally, very few things have changed because you're still dealing with the instance at a time. You always configure VMs whenever you want to scale some smart system, tries to do something, issues a recommendation, and then you're, you, you're dealing with a VM. You instantiate another one, or you're killing one, or you know, you're allocating more memory to that virtual machine, you're moving it somewhere. And then came cloud, and there, were a lot of, there was a lot of hype about how cloud should work. And you know, a lot of people assumed that clouds will be operating in a way that basically allows you to run your apps. But in reality, majority of clouds do nothing else but to allow you uh, instantiation of a virtual machine and kind of hooking it up to the rest of the uh, infrastructure, such as networking and storage. Right? Still, your unit of control is a virtual machine. And then you have up the stack tools for like configuring the hosts, uh, namely chefs, puppets of the world, and you know they could have solved the uh, sort of like the configuration of the entire application. Instead, they are looking at how to rubber stamp things that are very much alike, right? And again, they do it instance at a time, but it at least allows you to rubber stamp multiple instances that are looking almost identical to each other, right? And what people always forget about that, you know, the purpose of IT's existence is running applications, right? But that knowledge is lost, right? By the time the application guy communicates what he needs from the infrastructure, there is no trace back to uh, what the original intent was, right? And when things break or when things need to be updated, that becomes a very, very huge problem because nobody knows what it is. Right? And God forbid you have to retire something, you always have a lot of garbage collection problems. Uh, if you want to grow something, you always forget to update some firewall or load balancer or something else. Uh, because there is a lack of, general lack of understanding of the uh, original intent and the metadata that describes it. So basically, why not just take the original intent and express it as metadata, right? And define sort of application structure, all of its behaviors, dependencies on other applications, platforms, uh, infrastructure, or anything, in a way that's completely instance independent, right? Don't think about how many VMs you will have. Think about the building blocks of the application and how they interact with each other and how they consume infrastructure, how they consume uh, various other services within the data center, and do it in a way that's architecture agnostic. The reason why you want to think about architectural agnostic uh, nature of this is, what if you have to move your application from one data center to another or across multiple uh, architecturally diverse environments? If you think about it that way, your application becomes completely portable. So whether you're running at home in your data center or whether you're running in the cloud or if you're running in a new pod that you built out, how application describes it, it needs should not change based on the architecture. Right? And you know, also it should basically fulfill things from the standpoint of, the, uh, of, of, how, of how the application architect uh, thinks about the application itself rather than thinking about how you tie various virtual machines to various bits of infrastructure. Right? It's not about that you know, there's a VLAN and you have a bunch of VMs hanging over the VLAN. You basically have an application component that talks to another application component and you know how to scale those application components and you know how they interact and therefore you can derive all of the infrastructure rules. So, and once you define this, you can build an automatically enforced mechanism that basically self-conversion, fault tolerant, and fully automates entire application lifecycle, right? And all of these sort of infrastructure underneath. So this way, you basically get to define your app, and you drop the metadata, and hit the easy button, and the rest of it, robot does for you. So if you look at the uh, metadata, and if you look at the structure of the application, it's, it's really easy to notice. Like, you know, application can be described as a bunch of boxes that interact with each other, and each of those boxes have uh, 
various sets of requirements, whether it concerns how various things interact with each other or how they consume the infrastructure or how they interact with the external entities. Right? But all those things are describable as sets of relationships and sets of uh, things that interact with other things. And each of those things also have lives of their own, right? They can scale independently, but when they scale, they can affect state of other things that have dependency on those components. Also, you can think about it as a recursive problem where you can build applications comprising of other applications. For example, if I have a big data service and uh, Dan, let's say, uh, wants to run analytics service, he can rely on my uh, big data service and then Keith, can build some financial analysis tool that runs uh, on top of dense stuff. So neither of them need to understand the implementation detail of the other. They just consume services, right? So this way, uh, you can think about this as metadata as a building block of the service-oriented architecture, right? And people have tried to do that before, but they always try to treat things in a very elemental ways where you need specific detail from something rather than expressing the intent. So you define the intent and basically how applications talk to each other, how they sort of have a life of their own, and then allow the robot uh, enforce whatever the desired intent is. And that's called automation, right? So basically, you take the metadata and then you instantiate a logical overlay that is materialized in a self-enforced logical container. So basically, think about the logical container as something that takes the application and understands its, its needs on the infrastructure, it understands the interactions with other sets of the application, and it can scale it independently as, a, as, a, as an autom autonomous unit. And if things need to be reallocated, it knows how to restore state. It, needs to, it, it knows how to uh, resurrect instances if they uh, fail. It knows how to provide HA, optimization, all of that stuff. And it has to be enforced as a self-contained uh, unit. And atomicity is a very important thing. So you have intent uh, that you specify as like, you know, what your application needs. And you know, the idea of any sort of automation system is to basically you know, look at the capabilities and state down below in the infrastructure and realize this intent uh, in automated fashion. But what people often forget that there are also a number of op um, operational constraints. Right? So in addition to just thinking about intent, the people who own the infrastructure need to be able to specify uh, the constraints and, and, and various technological preferences of how those intent policies can be materialized or rendered into the, uh, in, into the substrate domains below, right? For example, um, you know, if you say that you want to you, 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 you have isolation with the network, as an intent, you should not be saying that you, know, you want to rely on VLAN or VXLAN or any other virtualization technology. You basically say, I need to have isolation. And it's up to the infrastructure policies or operational constraints policies as to identify how those things are being rendered. And another thing that's uh, often forgotten is the governance, right? Governance is a system that basically goes and checks whether whatever is going on within the application world is in compliance with the general rules of given IT organization. And you combine all four of these things and you create a continuous policy loop. This is not orchestration. This policy loop is continuously executing, right? Whenever there is divergence from the desire, you basically reconverge and you reconfigure infrastructure and then you take input from you know, the state, governance, and the operational constraints. And you always up to date and you, 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 you can always uh, reconverge if your operational environment changes. So for example, if something fails, you can always resurrect it somewhere else because you're enforcing the constraint. Right. And if you look at the constraint enforcement, it's basically a very simple, uh, humanly understandable problem. Right? What you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, minimize the discrepancy between the uh, desire and reality, which is also known as disappointment. Right? So whenever you try to deploy something that doesn't work, it causes a huge amount of disappointment. So the, uh, the goal of the robot is to completely obliterate that. Right? And you know, it doesn't really matter where that those, those objectives are being enforced, but once you start thinking about this problem in, in, in this fashion, uh, it's, it's, it's easy to start thinking about this as a distributed problem. 
So you can think about it as a uh, hierarchy of uh, policy enforcement loops or con uh, control feedback loops, right? So you basically do all of the enforcement as close to the metal as possible, but not closer, right? So the reason why you want to do that is because you really want to make sure that decisions that need to be made very fast can be made very fast. So making localized decision and not punting into some large brain that has to process a lot of information is a reasonable strategy here. Also, you can have hierarchy of the enforcement loops, right? Where a lot of the stuff that requires very quick thinking is performed locally, and then stuff that requires sort of global thinking, understanding of the global picture, can be done in a, in a, in a, in a wider loop where you s touch some centralized logic. For example, if you want to do uh, scheduling of something, you obviously need to require some centralized logic, right? So you can make a placement decision. But if you need to uh, allocate a little bit more CPU to a virtual machine or a container, uh, these decisions can be made uh, locally. And let's say you just start crowding out somebody else on a, on a, on a given host. Uh, there are multiple ways of doing this. Like today, you would go to central brain, and central brain decides a lot of this stuff. But you can make the decision locally and say, OK, this guy is crowding somebody else out. And if he has higher priority or he's paying more credits for his stay on this host, uh, you know, like maybe you should vacate others. Or maybe you should vacate that guy. And that way you basically issue the uh, uh, trigger to the uh, scheduler. And scheduler can run its own slower policy loop and basically figure out where to place uh, the, that, that, that resource somewhere else in the data center. So this is solvable as a sort of hierarchical uh, enforcement loop problem. And that's it.